For my final precepts, I decided to talk about how to teach history when perceptions of the past are continually changing and evolving throughout time. So I found four articles, and they're all very different from each other. Two in the fact that they're very specific and give a kind of wider scope of why we should be teaching a more accurate um, portrayal of history. And then two are very specific to specific areas in a history classroom that could use more work um, with a better portrayal of an accurate history. And those are the subtler colonial um, tensions with indigenous peoples and also the slave trade and the inner workings of slavery and the slave trade. So in my first article, What Makes Difficult History Difficult, this article basically emphasize that students should be taught difficult history because it only serves them greater in the future as they'll be better able to tackle more difficult issues and to act civilly um, and be more engaged with politics when they are older and full citizens. And it also gave an overview of the history of history education in schools and how it was used towards the late 19th century as a tool to kind of unify the country. And that's why there's sort of a um, bias swayed positive patriotism when attached to history nowadays, when we view tensions with the North and the South, when we view slavery or even like subtle or colonial interactions with indigenous people, we kind of tend to look at it in a biased way and present the United States as something greater than it was and as if they didn't know what they were doing was wrong and that is not true at all. And so we really need to be diligent and make sure we teach students an accurate portrayal of what is actually happening because another main point of this article was that history as a school subject is a, a primary reason for history class as a school subject is to create well-versed, well-knowledgeable students. And if we give them an inaccurate history, we're only doing them a disservice and creating citizens that are not knowledgeable or well-versed. And so my next article talked more specifically about African slavery and how we teach the origins of slavery. And so this was very interesting because it actually gave a specific approach on how to do this. And this author was reasoning that there should be a more pluralistic approach to teaching slavery instead of the more damage centered approach that is usually that is traditionally taught in history classrooms. And the damage centered approach is involves teaching that focuses primarily on the victimization of Africans in Africa. And it also includes a historical context that shows students that there are other races that were once enslaved, like whites, blacks, and Native Americans. However, that can serve to confuse students as it doesn't really give a reasoning or basis for why Africans were chosen to be imported to the United States or to the 13 colonies. It kind of just serves more to be confusing, but a pluralistic approach kind of acknowledges um, different contexts and it also acknowledges an African, the African side to this um, history too. And it kind of, it actually shows what happened in Africa and many history classes and many history teachers tend to completely ignore Africa in their teaching. But um, a pluralistic approach would instead teach the complex history of Africa and would we'll talk about how um, larger political entities in Africa, such as um, the Asante Empire, were able to capture smaller communities and enslave them and then sell them to um, white slavers that, and then they would be sent to the 13 colonies. Usually we um, skip that in a traditional history classroom. We don't even really talk about Africans capturing each other at all. and basically just make it a, a slaver thing where they come in and ship off just Africans to the New World, to the Mid-Atlantic. That's usually where it starts, but we need to go back further. And that will allow s students to gain a deeper understanding of the complexities of slavery. 
and it will also acknowledge African history, which is usually not addressed in traditional history classrooms. And then my next piece that I looked at was had to do with Canada. And I thought this was very interesting because it talked about how the Canadian federal government and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has made it a um, mission in their country to kind of give a more accurate portrayal of the indigenous settler relationship. And there are efforts, federal efforts and governmental efforts for schooling to be changed to kind of portray a more accurate history of this. And I thought that was very interesting. But what is also interesting is that the author of this makes a point that in order to successfully teach a real account of what actually happened between settler and indigenous relationship, we need to look at three major tensions that are still haunting the indigenous community. And that revolves around the narrative that indigenous peoples are placed under, the fact that we view history as temporary, and we also need to come to terms with identity, both indigenous and non-indigenous, and understand where we ourselves are um, in this complex colonial structure that is still going on. But I chose to focus on the temporal temporality aspect of this, and this this author makes the point that we need to present historical events in a way that shows that these colonial structures or structures in the past do have ongoing legacies that are present in the future as well. And they petition that we need to, that teachers need to teach students to see what traditions and structures um, they themselves are still a part of and still exist in the country. And that they need to make a point to teach students that colonization is not over, but an ongoing structural relationship. And I think this is very important and could definitely be used in today's, uh, in our own country, in today's um, world as well. Could definitely carry over from the Canadian aspect um, into the United States because we don't have the exact same history, but we have a very similar relationship in the way that we have kind of ignored the indigenous history and all of their um, hardships when we teach history. And then for my final piece, it was more of a broad one, like the first piece I talked about. Um, and it talked about John Dewey and his view of democracy and how um, schooling is very important into creating a well-versed democratic citizen. And so what I really took away from this was his emphasis on reflective inquiry, which is basically just teaching students that they need to be open-minded and ready to take in different perspectives, even though it may not be one that they're already coming into the classroom with. And I thought what was really um, significant was when he says a major barrier to inquiry is habit, and that's often found in tradition and custom. And we need to teach students to kind of be more skeptic and to actually kind of like critically think about the information they're taking in and see if maybe something seems off to them. They need to think critically and um, teaching those skills will ultimately create a better well-versed citizen in the future when students finally graduate because they will be more likely to challenge um, unjust political systems, but they'll also be more likely to embrace diversity and to accept different perspectives of thought that are not their own which is very important, especially in our country where there's many different viewpoints coming from um, across the aisles, across political parties, across just people of different races. We need to be inclusive of everyone and to really take in everyone's different perspective. And so I think that there's a lot that needs to be done in history classrooms, but, um, and I think that starts with a history teacher and allowing students to see multiple perspectives and to really gain a better, more full understanding of what actually happened in the past.